Okay, so this is the last of the efficiency videos, and I'm going to go over different ways to permute your trials to improve efficiency. So there are different strategies for this. Of course, um, geez, I didn't go over the ones you should know back. You should watch the other, at least the first two videos on efficiency before this, because they'll go over the difference between detection and estimation, which are the two types of efficiency, which I will be discussing here. Um, right, so we want to maximize our efficiency. So it's going to depend on your model and your contrasts. And it turns out you can't have the best of both worlds. Um, we'll see in an illustration I'll show, uh, basically a figure from a paper, that when you maximize one, if you have a design that maximizes detection, it will tend to minimize estimation and vice versa. So you can't maximize them both. And that's why when you're designing your study, you really need to think about how you're going to analyze the data and what's important for you to get out of your data. So uh, what we're going to focus on here is if you have multiple stimulus types, how do you choose the order? So the last lecture looked at a MATLAB demo, and we saw that we didn't change the order there, but we looked at how jittering affected uh, efficiency. Reordering the stimuli, if you have multiple stimulus types, also will have the same effect. So if you have four stimulus types, faces, houses, places, and you're showing them, um, you could show them in blocks and that will maximize one type of efficiency, but then you can randomly order them and that'll maximize another type of efficiency. And even within those random orders or having them blocked, different orderings will have uh, more efficiency. Anyhow, um, you can use some type of a search algorithm. So I'm going to talk about search algorithms here. The first is simply what we did last time, which is to just randomly try a bunch of design setups and choose the one with the best efficiency. So this can take a long time and I don't know, sometimes it's easy. If you have access to um, a really big computing system where you can just launch a bunch of jobs at once and let it run for a day, Maybe it's not that big of a deal to just randomly try a bunch of design setups. Um, right, so it's not a very efficient, computation, computationally efficient way of maximizing your efficiency. Also, sometimes you might want to consider psychological factors. So this is typically uh, where I run into snags because somebody will ask me to run an efficiency study, I will run one and then show them the ordering and they're like, no, no, silly statistician, I can't have three faces in a row, um, right? So it's usually I ask about these things before I do it, but right, there are psychological considerations to take as well. And it's really hard to factor those into an algorithm. Okay, so I'm going to start with the permuted block design. And um, here we have three types of stimuli. Uh, you could think of this, maybe this light blue is fixation, and then we have faces and houses. So we have a block of faces, block of fixation, block of houses, faces, fixation, uh, whatever I said, houses. So this will be, as we know from the previous lecture, if we have our stimuli blocked, that maximizes um, estimation detection but perhaps we don't want our stimuli blocked because it's really boring for a subject to sit there through a block of faces. Instead, we want to randomly order. So we know if we start with this design, it's going to have pretty high um, efficiency in terms of detection, but not in terms of estimation. So if we randomly choose to stimuli and swap them, We've now changed the efficiency a little bit, but maybe it meets our other considerations better. And they can repeat that for another pair of stimuli and swap them, and so on and so forth. So that's a permuted block design. <coughs> Pardon me. M sequences are something else you'll hear about, and they relate to this FIR model that I've now shown multiple times. So this, again, is the model. Uh, we have a window around each stimulus that we're modeling. So this first regressor is modeling the time point before the onset. I don't know why I have it that way, but that's just how it is. This is modeling the time point at the onset. There are 10 stimuli, so each of these regressors has 10 ones and the rest zeros, and the ones mark the bin that we're interested in. All right, so this is the FIR model. So 
M sequences work along with this model, and as we know, this model works along with estimation because we're estimating the shape of our response. And these parameters, these H's here, are the shape. Okay, so you'll notice the end of the window for one stimulus starts to run into the beginning of the window for the next stimulus. And that's not good because that means um, we're losing power and estimating the activation for this window right here because it's competing with this window here. So um, another way to think of this is each regressor is just a shifted version of the previous. We just scoot all these down from where they were in the previous regressor. And the less overlap between regressors equals more efficiency, which is what I was just talking about. So optimally, no regressor would overlap with another. Then we would have an optimal model. So we would avoid things like here, where the end of this trial is overlapping with the beginning of this trial. So these trials, you can see, are also evenly spaced. So not a lot of creativity in that model. So M sequences, um, they aren't just used for this, they're used all over the place, but they're sequences of ones and zeros that are maximally uncorrelated with shifted versions of themselves. Well, hey, that looks a lot like the regressors of our model, and we want them to be maximally uncorrelated with each other. So you just think of them, M sequences, as magical orderings that give us what we want, which is an efficient model in terms of uh, estimation. All right, so M sequences, again, these are special sequences. You can't just say I would like an M sequence for my 20 uh, trials of four types. I have five presentations of each trial. Um, they can exist for multiple trial types, but there are limitations. So one limitation is how long the run is, how many TRs you have, and how many trial types you have. So the number of trial types must be a prime or a power of a prime. These are just the rules of M sequences. I'm not gonna go into the theory of M sequences, but for example, you could have two, three, or four, because four is two squared. Five prime, seven prime, eight is two cubed, so it's allowed. 9 is 3 squared, etc. All right, so that's the number of trial types. Now the length of the series has to be q to the n minus 1, where q is the number of trial types, including null trials so, or, or fixation, whatever you're using as your kind of baseline stimulus, and n is an integer. So for example, let's say you have three trial types, you have two tasks and a null, and you'd like to have it as close as you can to 110 TRs then you could have three to the fourth, this is not a minus sign, nor is this, but this is. You could have three to the fourth minus one, which is 81, which is not enough, or three to the fifth minus one, which is 242, which is too many. Now your run is too long. So anyhow, you can see M sequences have some limitations. And again, they're optimizing estimation, not detection. The genetic algorithm uses the idea of genetics. If two good parents, and this theory that two good parents should produce an even better offspring. Um, so uh, in other words, mutations can lead to improvements. So the idea here is you have uh, two orderings and you cross them and you get the new orderings. Um, I don't know how helpful this image is. This is more helpful. Okay, let's look at this. Let's focus on this. So we have three stimulus lists. So there, are the, the red is one stimulus list, green is a different. So these are three competing designs. You could think of it like that. So we have three competing designs. Uh, there are four stimulus types, and these are the random orderings of them. You build the design matrices for each. Then once you have the design matrix, as we know, we all know how to compute efficiency now because that was in the last lecture you can compute the efficiency for each of those designs, which is given here, and then you select the two top designs. These two are the top. And then what you do is you create a new design, just like that kind of cartoony picture earlier. You swap out, you chop it in half somewhere, and you swap chunks from one design with chunks in another. Okay, and then you repeat. So that's generally how the uh, genetic algorithm works. 
There's also this improved genetic algorithm. So if you're going to read one paper, I think this paper is really clear. Um, if you want to know more about this stuff, and I will put a link to it in the info box. If I ever say I put a link to something and you go there and it's not there, just, uh, just put a comment on the Facebook or the Twitter or whatever. And be like, hey, you forgot the link. Um, because sometimes I record these uh, weeks before I post them. Anyway, this time I'll remember because I'm posting this as soon as I record it. All right, link to this paper. And what's cool about this paper is the figure I'm about to show you, and they just really clearly define everything, and it's a clear comparison with all the different methods that you could possibly use. So here's the figure. that I, Oh, and there's MATLAB code that goes along with it. I played with it a little bit. It's a little limiting. Um, it has to be, right? It's, it's almost impossible to create a general chunk of code that's going to work in terms of computing and efficiency for anybody's design. But they do have ways to account for psychological factors as well, which may be of interest to some of you. And it's MATLAB code, if I recall. Hopefully it's still out there. I'm sure it is. So there's a lot going on here. I'll just step you through it. So they improved upon the genetic algorithm that I just showed you. So that's uh, Wager Nichols. Um, Oh, I should have said that before. So Tor Wager and Tom Nichols did that. That's their genetic algorithm. And theirs is improved. Um, I forget the specifics. But they basically tweaked it and put these other improvements. So let's just look at these two first. So, um, and let me explain the plot. So this is a cool plot because it shows exactly what I was talking about at the beginning. The trade-off between efficiency for estimation and for detection. So I don't like this wording. Uh, this is called normalized estimation efficiency. This is estimation. And this is normalized detection power. This is detection. I don't like using the word power because people think it's actual power and it's not. So they're both efficiency calculations. So we have detection on the y-axis. So convolving with an HRF, sorry I said y, convolving with an HRF models down here on the x-axis, FIR model on the y-axis. So for example, the block design is this square filled in box. And here it is, it only appears once. But you can see it's really, it's really efficient if you're using a convolved HRF. It's really inefficient if you're interested in an FIR model. So there's our, our blocked trials. Okay, then there are genetic algorithms out here and you can see that it is outside of the nichols wager genetic algorithm, meaning they're able to, to weasel out a little more efficiency than wager nichols um, which is pretty cool. And then you can see it follows this arc because it's, it's impossible to be up here maximizing both, so you kind of just go along here. Okay, so that's theirs. Uh, the clustered M sequence. So it's a type of M sequence, which I talked about a second ago. Those are the diamonds. So those are down here, and it does okay, um, but it's it's not great. Um, and then there is the permuted block design, which I also talked about. Those are the open squares, and they're around the same as the clustered M sequence. So one is not really better than the other. Then the mixed design, my apology, I don't recall what the, the mixed design is. Then um, M sequence, which is not the clustered M sequence, but it's just, come on, mouse, just an M sequence. And there was just one, and that's up here. And as I said before, M sequences are optimizing FIR models. That's the whole point behind them. So you can see it has really high efficiency for an FIR model, not great efficiency for detection power. Okay, and then we have the block design, as I said, which is down here. Now, they don't have random, kind of like the MATLAB code I showed, or if you're just to randomly permute things and see where, where you landed, um, that would be a fun exercise for someone to do, to see if you just randomly generated hundreds of thousands of designs to see where you landed. Um, and you can recreate this figure with their code. I'm just remembering that. I'm almost positive they set it up so you can recreate this figure me. 
My guess, my intuition, is that when we just randomly generate a bunch of designs, we're probably landing in here somewhere. So middle of the road for both detection and estimation. That is my best guess because I've seen people use OpSeq, which I'm almost positive is based on uh, estimation. And they have pretty efficient designs, even though they're using a convolved HRF. I still prefer just code it yourself. I gave you the code. It should be easy for you to, not easy. With some work, you can adapt that to yours. I'm not going to lie. It's going to take a little work. So anyway, I think this is pretty cool. It's kind of everything in one plot. And their approach does look pretty sweet. So, so what will you use? It really depends on how you feel. So OpSeq, again, is just... Um, FIR model and genetic algorithm approaches are also a little limited um, to design uh, types. And as I said, you can just do it yourself. See the last video, crank out a ton of simulations and pick your most, most efficient designs. And I will repeat, repeat this. I am finding in some of my simulation work that there can be some negative effects due to slight biases in designs if you use the same stimulus ordering for all of your subjects. So it's definitely the case if you're doing pattern classification or pattern similarity analyses, uh, you can have issues if you use the same stimulus ordering for all your subjects. So I, and I've seen some issues even just with uh, task activation. I would recommend um, having more stimulus orderings than that, even if possible, a unique stimulus ordering for each subject. So that is it. Thank you very much, and I hope everybody has a wonderful day.